Well, there's an incident from uh, the late 70s, back when I was ski patrolling on Whistler. And it was actually the head of the ski patrol at the time. I didn't like the situation above us on North Face High. We'd had a lot of snow. We'd had a couple of feet of snow. So things seemed to be really loaded. Standing on this little moraine where I was, I thought I heard a jet plane going over my head. And I looked up, and it was an avalanche coming down out of North Face High. Bruce Watt was uh, near the edge of the avalanche, and he got tumbled. And I watched him, and he got tumbled around. Yeah, somebody yelled avalanche, and the whole north face of Whistler Mountain came down on top of us. Uh, visiting patroller from Snowbird and myself were at the end of the line, and we got taken and uh, swept along on top Bruce of the Bruce Watt uh, area was buried Surprise. so shallowly that he had one arm out, and the guys, when they came to find him, said they could actually see him beneath the snow. Yet Bruce said that he struggled like crazy to try and make an air pocket for himself. Uh, and he said he couldn't move anything underneath that snow. He, he said he was like being encased in, in concrete or something. He said he was and Luckily, uh, one of the fellows on the team came over and, and dug me out to my head right, right after it happened. So uh, he said to me, uh, you know, the other guy's totally buried. You know, what should we do? And I said, get me out of here because, you know, I'm really, I was really scared and struggling. And uh, John Hetherington was doing a grid search with uh, Peeps. And he had located the general area. And uh, so I took my ski off and started to probe around to try and find a more precise spot where we could find the body. And we uh, located him, and every, everybody else started digging, and we dug like mad. I think we went down. Back in those days, the Whistler Ski Patrol didn't carry shovels, as a matter of course. So we actually dug down four feet with our hands. So there were five of us digging like crazy men. It was seven minutes. So he was buried for seven minutes. He was without oxygen for approximately seven minutes, which is longer than you're supposed to be able to stay alive, I think, without oxygen. And his mouth was full of snow, so he wasn't breathing. He said afterwards that uh, he, had, he was on his way out and that he'd resigned himself to, to die, and he was gone unconscious, and he was quite surprised to come back to life again. The experience of, of being buried was, uh, was a real eye-opener. Um, we were so lucky that we, that we found uh, Rick in, in time, and uh, he's okay. Um, but that made us feel uh, mortal. And uh, the, the lesson that, that I'd been told years before was, the avalanche doesn't recognize you as an, ax as an expert. And that's so true. You, you can have all, the, all of the knowledge in the world, but you just can't figure it all out all the time. And. Uh, so that made me think that uh, we needed a way to kind of have a backup. The backup is CARTA, the Canadian Avalanche Rescue Dog Association. In 1979, Bruce Watt and his dog Radar became the first civilian avalanche rescue dog and handler team in Canada. Today, rescue dogs are a common sight in the mountains of North America. Right now we've got 23 operational teams uh, located in various regions of uh, British Columbia, a couple in Alberta and, and a few up in the Yukon as well. Our goal is to save, save lives, save people buried in avalanches. And one day, uh, we haven't had a live recovery yet in Canada, there's been two in the States. But it's just a matter of time. Uh, more people are skiing in the mountains. We're getting more teams trained uh, to respond. And uh, we'll, you know, it's a matter of time. We'll have a live recovery sooner or later. In, in Europe, they've been using dogs for over 50 years. And they have live recoveries pretty much on an annual basis because they can get there quick enough. Quest, search. What do you got there? What do you got there? Dig it out of there. One of the big advantages of the dogs is that they can find people beneath the snow regardless if they're wearing a peeps or not. Good boy! Good dog, Quest! Good search. The dogs are also used for ground searches, working with search and rescue teams looking for missing people. This is a big spruce tree. And, well, it's quite a big spruce tree. You can see how big the branches are and what happens to form a tree well is the snow will fall and the snow will stay on the branches. So it creates, creates what we call a tree well. But there's no snow around the tree, but the branches are kind of covering up the, 
the well, and uh, they're quite quite dangerous for skiers and snowboarders if they fall into the backwards and head down or anything like that because it's really hard to get out of them. So if you're skiing in the trees, ski with a buddy. Just a month before this interview, Yvonne and Cisco found a snowboarder in a tree well. He was just outside the ski area, a hundred meters from a boundary rope. But he was by himself, and when he fell into the tree well, no one heard his calls for help, and he died. It's the second victim Cisco has found in two years. You know, dealing with stuff here, you, sometimes you wonder, it's, you think er, everybody's out here just to have fun, and, and then one, one little slip up, and boom, and you think, wow, is that worth it? But I, have, I had a hard time with this, this guy um, over at Blackholm. I just kind of, the other search, I think a lot came back to me. And uh, I thought, oh, God, why? But then it's just like, well, it's part of life in the mountains, and that's, that's it. That's the only way you can look at it. It's not fair. It's not anything. And people are out here to enjoy themselves. And sometimes, you know, it could be their mistake. It could be just, it was their time to go. That's, that's it. It's life in the mountains. In the early 80s, skiing was changing, the equipment was getting better, and so were skiers. Mountains like Whistler and Blackcomb offered challenges for the advanced skiers. The best skiers in the world come here for the simple reason it's got some of the best skiing in the world. never considered skiing or trying snowboards and loving it. The sport has been experiencing explosive growth and the result is more people on the slopes than ever before. We're seeing so many more people on the hill in general it just makes sense that more people are venturing outside of the boundary. Now in the old days it used to take uh, two days, three days for all the easier access uh, uh, powder to be skied up. Now it's, it's a couple of hours. So people want to experience more powder skiing, they're tempted to go into the backcountry. You can categorize uh, the backcountry skier into, into three groups. Uh, at least uh, the, the one group is the, is the, the group of people that um, don't really think about where they're going. They may not even know where they're going, but they see a slope, it looks inviting. It's out of bounds, uh, but they don't really uh, even consider it. Um, the, the sign is being a warning, and away they go. Another group would be the people that um, know the area pretty well, uh, maybe get a little overconfident, um, know they're going outside of the boundary, and they're not prepared for it. But they feel that because they're close enough to the ski area, uh, there's some security there, uh, which is, of course, false security. And then there's the group, uh, the group that we like, and the and the group that uh, are very self-sufficient, uh, they're well-equipped, well-trained, and uh, certainly prepared for whatever may come their way. The word extreme has become part of the modern day vocabulary. The extreme was invented in the mountains by crazy ski bums with a lot of skill and literally no fear. People are jumping off cliffs and into steep chutes that were never skied before. For every person who knows what they're doing, there's a foolish thrill seeker who gets in way over their head. Scott Fulmer. Ex-World Cup freestyler is a filmmaker. His canvas is the mountains and his subjects are the elite of the extreme skiing and boarding world. People he shoots are experienced in avalanche avoidance, backcountry route finding and safety techniques. One of my biggest concerns with uh, backcountry skiing is uh, a lot of the people that are watching the movies that we're making thinking that we're just going back there and following us and not carrying the proper uh, survival 
equipment and not knowing how to use it if they do have it. Um, I, I think that for a lot of people, the backcountry is a great thing, but uh, I don't know that everybody's prepared for what's potentially out there in form of hazards. A lot of people don't even uh, don't even understand the uh, the risks involved. Most people that tour out here without yeah. their peeps and shovel don't really even realize that the cornice they're on has been getting sun all day, and it's uh, you know very possible it will drop or it will slide. It's just you know I, I think a lot of people are clueless in Disneyland here. Yeah, absolutely. You know it's it's humbling. You see the. Uh, you see what's going on, you see the risks, and you see the how powerful Mother Nature really is. And, uh, you know, if you plan to, to play with Mother Nature, be prepared for her to kick back every time we all take one, two, three, four, how many steps forward, but you always get kicked back. It's rolling with you, Evelyn! with a lot of dough visit the backcountry in style. No hiking for this lot. Within minutes, they're miles from the nearest ski area and into the deep powder. When you buy into a heli skiing trip, you're buying expertise and heli ski operators have a good safety record. You travel with experienced guides who know the terrain and monitor the snowpack in their area. But even with all the experience, knowledge and safety precautions, you're in the backcountry and things can still go wrong. <laughs> this camera is covered with snow and Scott Fulmer is digging for his life after being hit by an avalanche and partially buried. Fulmer was following a group of three skiers when the slope broke away. The group's guide was helplessly waiting at the bottom of the hill he'd skied moments before. Fulmer's got a dislocated elbow, but he manages to dig himself out and record these dramatic pictures. Is everyone out? You all right? Yeah, I'm all right, but is anybody under? I, uh... The three skiers that Scott was following down the hill have disappeared. Well, hindsight's 2020. There's nothing that would have kept us off that slope, really. And yet, uh, you know, accidents uh, do occur. That's why they call them accidents. Yes, right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Scott Fulmer is alive because he was lucky, not because of his skill and experience. If he had been closer to the bottom of the slope, they would have been digging for him, too. You know, a lot of skiers and snowmobilers, snowboarders think, oh, it'll never happen to me, you know, uh, you know I'm bulletproof, I'm bombproof, or uh, that only happens to, you know, nerds or something. Well, I, I've actually been involved in about four avalanches over the years, and uh, the only one that I was injured in was the one that killed three people, but it can happen to anybody, and uh, nobody's uh, beyond the scope of getting uh, caught up in one of these things. It's like, well... It's part of life in the mountains, and that's that's it. That's the only way you can look at it. It's not fair. It's not anything, and it could be their mistake. It could be just it was their time to go. That's that's it. It's life in the mountains.
the back country around here, it's totally open. Once you leave the back country, you're on your own and you're allowed to access the back country. Whereas some spots in the States and in the Banff area, you're not allowed to access the, the out of bounds. So we want to keep that access totally open. So we'll try and inform people going out there the best we can as to what the conditions are and try and encourage them to be uh, well equipped for what they might encounter out there. No, they should have rescue gear, should have a bit of knowledge, and they should at least know the terrain. There's kind of a number of steps. People going into the backcountry don't need to take a seven-day professional course, but people who are going into the backcountry for recreation should really take a, a two- or three-day recreational avalanche course, avalanche awareness course, and they're, they're available all over the place. And they basically cover similar curriculum, and it's just a, an entry level into how, what to do in the backcountry, how to uh, take precautions and how to uh, reduce your risk in the backcountry. And that's a, a great start. That's not the end though. That it's real important that uh, you get experience, go out with really experienced people, uh, you know, start slowly, learn, uh, educate yourself, learn what risks are, when to go, talk to the people in the ski area, the ski patrollers, the guides, the Canadian Avalanche Centre and get the information and go from there. The mountains still hold magic. The allure that drew Aboriginal people seeking a spiritual place is still at work. And perhaps spirits do live here quietly challenging skiers and snowboarders to ride the mountain, tame it if they can. Danger is part of the appeal, but with some snow sense, the risks become acceptable and the experience unforgettable.